After I emerged uh, much relieved from the restroom, I walked into a large restaurant and found a place at the counter. While eating some eggs and hash browns, I glanced up as a large beefy fellow sporting a tractor cap advertising Cenex, a fertilizer company, sat down on a stool next to mine. He glanced at me with a scowl, and uh, when a lady soon appeared to ask if he wanted coffee, he grumbled yes. He would, and proceeded to tell her what he wanted for breakfast. I'd like you to bring me uh, three eggs over easy, hash browns, three strips of bacon, and a slice of ham. Ooh, you've got a big man's appetite this morning, the waitress said. I sure do every goddamn day. She gave him a false mechanical, what I would even say was a sarcastic smile, and spun away. I don't think she likes me, he said, leaning toward me in a conspiratorial way. I wouldn't know, I said in a dismissive tone, which may have irritated him because he then said, You got a problem, buddy? At this I turned to him, looked into his face, and said, I sure do, son. And that's you creating one by asking that fucking question. And with that I rose and left to pay for my meal at the cashier counter. Early into the following Friday evening, uh, I was in my apartment mulling over just what I might do throughout the remaining hours of the night. I, I glanced over the newspaper in the entertainment section for a film I could conceivably enjoy, and of course all I found was the usual fare of comic book uh, superheroes pitted against monstrous inhuman villains, or crime thrillers involving a demoted, uh, a demoted drunk of a detective investigating the murderous path of a de dedicated serial killer, or a comedy of love uh, featuring a leading male star as a bungler and his counterpart leading lady is either a shrewd veteran liar or a ditz who bungles as often as her co-star. Then, while feeling a vague twinge of despair over the sheer likelihood that I'd find not a single movie I'd pay good money to see, I happened to notice an ad for Roscoe's Comedy Club. Admitting to myself that I could do with a few laps, I decided to go there. And then I considered uh, what would surely prove to be a dilemma were I to drive my car there and then proceed to get trashed with a few too many drinks. It was obvious to me that I'd begun to drink far more than was good for me once again <laughs> the other night in Bellingham. So I decided uh, to call a taxi company since I don't trust and have never employed an Uber driver. About a half hour later, I got a call from a cab driver who said he was waiting in front of the apartment building. I told him I'd be down there in less than five minutes. <clears throat> I stuffed my cigarettes into my shirt pocket, slipped once again into my suit coat, tore out my necktie altogether, uh, uh, stuffed my slim wallet into my front trouser pocket, tossed on my recently purchased trench coat, uh, fetched out my old fedora from the shelf in the hall closet, uh, snatched out my keys from the sofa and table drawer, went out the door and locked both the knob and the deadbolt and hurried down four flights of stairs to the street. The cabbie had his elbow resting on the bottom of the car window while smoking a cigarette. I walked up to the car and said, Hi, I'm Bernie Youngers, uh, the guy who called for the cab. Oh, sure, he said, hop in. Oh, I still have a bunch of junk in the back uh, seat. My previous fare wanted me to dump in the trash for him. A bit of biohazardous waste is my guess, so you'll need to sit in the front. When we pulled up in front of uh, Roscoe's Comedy Club, I saw that a small line had formed in front of the building. I had paid the driver with a trio of $10 bills and walked up to the end of the line. The couple directly in front of me turned for a moment and gave me a pair of odd looks, then turned away. Then I heard a muffled twitter from the girl, to which her young fellow responded with a 
few bored gestures along with one or two goofy looking expressions on his face. Well, perhaps my attire had inspired this short-lived eruption of amusement, who knows? If you allow yourself to become irritated over someone else's remarks, and especially just a mere glance, then you've already submitted to their influence and power over you. Was I going to hand that to a pair of strangers? Fuck no! So I ignored them. And when, a moment later, the guy turned toward me and glanced away from my eyes a tad upward to my hat, I gave him a look of hard, uncompromising contempt, which left the lad little doubt I would not hesitate to kick his ass if he insulted me. In fact, I despised this courteous people in general. Presently, he turned away and conferred sotto voce with his girlfriend. After I paid uh, the door fee of twenty bucks, I went into the main venue and found a small table well away from the merry couple who had stood just in front of me to get in. About ten minutes went by while well, I occasionally took a sip from my first drink of the night as I discreetly surveyed the crowd the way I imagine a private investigator on a stakeout would do as he awaited his target to show up. Then the host bounded onto the stage with a portable mic in hand and began to prep the crowd for this evening of entertainment in store for everyone out there and this diverse Seattle audience of ours, as he put it. Of course, uh, once Jack had gotten off the bus in Seattle, the first thing he did was to knock on the window of an idling taxi just down the block. He gave the driver the destination, a motel out along uh, U.S. Highway 101, a.k.a. the Pacific Highway, where he booked a room. The motel's uh, preposterous name was the Alpine Country Inn. This luxurious sounding inn smack dab beneath the flight paths, one of the flight paths, in and out of SeaTac Airport. Once in his room, the first thing Jack did uh, was to call Sheila, who uh, two months prior to this had booted her former fiancé out of her apartment. The time was just after 11 o'clock in the morning, and for Jack this was quite early in the day. And in addition to that, he'd slept only in fits and starts, as usual, on the bus. So he was a bit groggy. When Sheila tapped into her cell phone to accept Jack's call, she greeted him by saying, so, you're back in Seattle once again. What sort of plans have you got in mind? Oh, you mean apart from me rehearsing here in my motel room all afternoon? Yes, Jack. Well, I was hoping I'd be able to see you, sweetheart. Come by around six, mister. I'll have dinner ready and steaming on the table.